Hi, everyone. People are joining, so I'll give another minute or two to start the session. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. Welcome to the OECD site session today on living wage progress in the fashion sector, hosted by Fair Labor Association. My name is Ruo Xu Wang, Fair Compensation and Member Engagement Associate at FLA, and I'm honored to moderate today's webinar. Before we get into the topic, as we all know, Turkey and Syria were recently struck by devastating earthquake that has caused widespread destruction and loss of life. At FLA, we have regional staff who are dealing with these tragedies and our hearts have been heavy for them. In times of crisis, it is essential that we not only focus on immediate relief efforts, but also consider the long-term impact on the affected communities especially the workers and their family. FLA is closely monitoring developments on the ground and has been in touch with different stakeholders since the early hours of the earthquake. Please check the link in the chat for FLA's recommendations for company sourcing from suppliers in Turkey, as well as ways to help the country's citizens in this time of need. So without further ado, Let's begin today's discussion on the crucial topic of living wage progress in the fashion sector. First, please allow me to introduce today's speaker. As I mentioned, my name is Ruo Xu Wang. I'm the Fair Compensation Member Engagement Associate at FLA. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Tiffany Rogers, Director of Fair Compensation and Member Engagement, and also Feng Du, Acting Director of Social Compliance and Accreditation at FLA. We are also honored to be joined by Felicia Hoare, Technical Advisor at the Initiative for Global Solidarity at GIZ, and also two Fair Labor Companies representatives, Remy Aguilo, Director of Field Operations from Adidas, and Christy Lucius, Director of Sustainability at Fanatics. In today's webinar, we will first introduce fair labor and the living wage approach we are taking. And then we will share the partnership with IGS, Initiative Global Solidarity, and ERC, Research Center for Employment Relations in Vietnam. Then my colleague Fung will talk about fair labor living wage pilot in Vietnam launched last year. And then we will have our panel session my colleague Tiffany will discuss with field labor company representatives, Christine and Remy on company collaboration on living wage. In the end, we will have some time for the Q&A session. So throughout the webinar today, please feel free to put your question using the Q&A function box and we will address them during the Q&A session. With that, I will hand it over to Tiffany to talk about field labor and introduce the living wage approach we're taking.
Thank you, Roshu. Hello, hello, everyone. I'm Tiffany Rogers, uh, and it's really lovely to see you all today. Uh, and thank you, Roshu, for mentioning Turkey and raising how important it is that we consider how wages is the money we earn from a job, and it's what we use to respond with and take care of family and friends in times of crisis. Living wages is how we obtain that safety net, one that is desperately needed by the people of Turkey and Syria and many garment workers around the world and part of our basic human rights. Uh, we're also celebrating Valentine's Day in the US, so I do want to take a moment to share some peace, love, and gratitude for everyone that showed up to our OECD side session today. Uh, and for those of you who don't know much about the Fair Labor Association, we're a lean nonprofit in the labor rights and supply chain space. At Fair Labor, we direct we work with businesses to remediate labor rights violations in their supply chains and improve their social compliance and purchasing practices programs to respect human rights. We largely work in two industries, manufacturing in the fashion sector and agriculture at the farm level with companies in coffee, cocoa, hazelnuts, and palm oil sectors. In addition to businesses, our standards and strategies are informed by a multi-stakeholder framework, including colleges and universities and civil society and unions. As the director of fair compensation and member engagement, I have the exciting job of leading the implementation of our fair compensation strategy. And I've benefited from the great leaders and experts that also work on setting the foundation of this work. Uh, I'll mention Jason Judd, who is now the executive director at the Global Labor Institute at Cornell's ILR School, who launched our 2015 Fair Compensation Work Plan, uh, and Renee Bowers, who is now the senior manager of Fair Wages at Amazon, who launched our current Fair Compensation Strategy that we'll talk about today. Uh, fair Labor has been on quite the journey to implement our fair compensation standards within our company's codes of conduct and in actual measuring and reporting of progress. For fair compensation, we're talking about the workers' right to have wages that meet their basic needs and provide some savings within the regular work week, so the right to earn a living wage without overtime. And we developed a wage data collection tool and our online fair compensation dashboard that allows for our members to measure their living wage progress using the Global Living Wage Coalition estimates and inform their fair compensation and living wage blueprint, which is an operational action plan that coordinates and actualizes the company's commitment to living wage and fair compensation within its company. Last year, all our accredited uh, companies made a public commitment to these standards and provided information of how they're implementing them. And now we're focused on public reporting and wanting to ensure progress is part of that reporting. And last but not least, uh, we joined the Global Living Wage Coalition Action Network in 2022 to affirm this commitment and work with organ other organizations on living wage. And so now I'm going to pass it back to Roshu, who will talk more about our tools. Thanks, Tiffany. The wage data collection tool is an Excel-based model that is straightforward and scalable, allowing companies to gather workers' wage data from factories in the apparel, footwear, and also accessory supply chains. Our methodology is based on the book, Living Wage Around the World, written by the founders of Anchor Research Institute, Richard and Martha Anchor. In the tool, we are collecting different payment types, including basic wage, which can be hourly pay or piece rate, and also incentive, in-kind benefit, cash benefit, taxes and deduction, and we are also collecting overtime pay in the tool. FLA is making this tool publicly available at no cost for companies to measure their living wage gap in supply chain. You can download it through the link in the chat or on FLA website. Here is a GIF demo of the fair compensation dashboard net wage ladder. The dashboard allows company to analyze average worker wages, measure those wages against living wage benchmarks, and track progress year over year. After uploading the wage data collection tool to the online dashboard, you will be able to visualize it and have a better understanding of the living wage gap comparing against benchmarks in our database for more than 32 countries. As we are using GLWC living wage estimates for living wage benchmarks. 
To help more companies analyze their living wage gap, FLA provides the subscription service to the online fair compensation dashboard for non-FLA members. Today, all FLA companies and suppliers are using FLA's fair compensation toolkits to collect wage data, analyze the living wage gap, and make progress to close the gaps. With that, I will hand it back to Tiffany to share some data analysis and the case study on fair compensation. Thanks, Roshu. So uh, we launched our uh, fair compensation dashboard in February 2020, and truly the timing could not have been more crucial because it allowed us to mobilize our member companies and suppliers to ensure they're collecting wage data during a time in which workers' wages were in flux due to mandatory shutdowns and supply chain disruptions from the pandemic. This was not an easy effort, and yet with over 50 companies collecting wage data on a cyclical basis, we could understand how workers were being impacted. Here we're sharing uh, data, updated analysis of the FLA average net wages in Vietnam from 2019 to 2021. This analysis is from 340 factory data sets from our members, 96 in 2019, 103 in 2020, and 141 in 2021. And we can see a trend that is not surprising. Wages for workers in our members' Tier 1 supply chain decreased 4% from 2019 to 2020 and had a limited 2% recovery in 2021. That's a decrease of about 11 US dollars per month in 2020 and an increase of 6 US dollars. So garment workers in Vietnam still need about an average of 5 US dollars per month to get back to 2019 wages. Uh, and that's not including inflation. So it's clear we have the tools to measure the gap and we need to focus on solutions. For the past few years, uh, while our companies have been scaling data collection in their supply chain, uh, FLA has been working on how to identify solutions and focus on success for workers on living wage. And we knew workers' hours and wages were very much connected, especially in the garment industry. And through our case study, we found that excessive overtime can put downward pressure on workers' living wage progress. From our assessments conducted from 2012 to 2019 in Vietnam, 74% of our factories we assessed had overtime violations, where workers' hours exceeded over 60 hours per week. So that kind of set the hypothesis for the case study that we published in 2021. If factories have to reduce overtime hours, then they probably need to increase regular time wages. Otherwise, workers will be discouraged with lower wages and uh, leave to find higher wages. It's just human nature. Uh, and that's what happened in the three factories in our case study. Uh, on the slide here, you see the end results of the wage improvements that Mexport Limited did uh, as part of that case study. We saw a changes in compensation systems and shifts from piece rate to more stable wages and incentive pay. And all three factories work to improve efficiency and planning, and it took two to three years to increase workers' wages to above the GLWC estimates in China and Vietnam, an increase in average net wages uh, ranging from 29 to 57 percent. I will mention this case study was pre-COVID, and yet it's still relevant. Our case study also revealed the importance of buyers' commitments to responsible purchasing practices, ensuring suppliers have stability and transparency from its buyers so that they can make improvements to efficiency and compensation systems and HR and worker training and engagement systems. So we're about halfway through the presentation now, and if you've gotten anything, it should be that Fair Labor has the tools to measure the living wage gap. But measuring the living wage gap is not our ultimate goal. Our goal is to close the living wage gap. And for us, the next two years of our fair compensation strategy is focusing on solutions, how we implement and test them, how we scale and share learnings in the fashion industry and others, uh, which leads us to our living wage pilot in Vietnam. 
So there are a few reasons on the slide on why we are doing this pilot. All of it is good NGO speak, uh, driving collaboration and partnerships while addressing this human rights problem. And Fung and Felicia will talk more about that and how we're doing all of it. Uh, the main point of why we are doing this pilot is because we know we can make living wage progress in the fashion manufacturing sector in Vietnam. Based on what we know about the country, the commitment the government has shown through improving its labor code for workers year over year, our own wage data analysis, and the progress our companies have shown in improving their purchasing and hours of work practices at the factory level. So now I will pass it over to Felicia Ur from Initiative of Global Solidarity to uh, speak more about how the pilot is part of our partnership approach to implementing solutions to labor rights issues like living wage. Thank you, Tiffany, and uh, really happy to speak to all of you today on and to be able to introduce you briefly to uh, what we are doing within IGS. So I work for a GIZ project, so German Development Corporation called Initiative for Global Solidarity which uh, was commissioned by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, the BMZ, as one of several accompanying measures to the German supply chain law. Our aim, as you can see here on the slide, is to support industry actors in addressing supply chain risks by the three principal means. First of all, improving supply chain data and transparency, improving worker access to grievance mechanisms, and relevant for this debate today, promoting models of shared responsibility, which basically means promoting strong partnership relations between buyers and their suppliers. Shared responsibility, in our view, is a key aspect to ensure rights are respected. In our view, it implies that both buyers and suppliers jointly revisit their business practices and invest to ensure that rights are respected and that each party takes their due share in it. Our main approach is to scale and replicate best practices, in particular in the textile and electronics industry, which is why we are so happy to be partnering with FLA. Uh, in our view, this is an exact excellent example of responsible purchasing practices and strong collaboration between buyers and suppliers, and how this can be harnessed to address supply chain risks, particularly uh, wages, as is here the case in this pilot. So collaboration is important to us, but it's not only important when it comes to companies being buying and supplying companies, but also in the broader ecosphere, which is why we encourage harmonization and collaboration between different MSIs for the most impactful projects. And we are therefore very glad that companies from other MSIs, um, such as the Partnership for Sustainable Textiles, are also joining in this project together with FLA members. Let me briefly explain to you why we think this is a particularly valuable project. As you know, it tackles the topics of wages and wages is um, really a priority in our work. It is closely related, related to so many other supply chain risks such as overtime as Tiffany already mentioned. And for these reasons, it's also a focal topic for the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development and you might see them if you attend the forum in the session on wages uh, as a participant there. So this is why we're really excited to um, be a partner in this project and support it and to move forward. And we're even looking into replication in other industries or sectors. And with that, I hand over to Fung to explain you what exactly this cool pilot project is. Hi Felicia, uh, hello everyone. I'm happy to provide you the detail of the Living Way pilot that the FLA and GIZ that we are doing in Vietnam. So first of all, besides GIZ is our project partner and funding organization. I would like to introduce another important project partner, the Research Center of Employment Relations or called ERC. ERC, the FLA project partner in Vietnam is an independent refresh, uh, research organization specializing in research, training, and consultancy on the labor-related issue. ERC aims at upholding labor standards and building healthy labor relations. They are local researchers for the Anchor Research Institute to conduct the GLWC Living Wage Studies in Vietnam. They are very well-known and reputable organization in Vietnam. Many of you in this webinar today knew them, and we are so delighted to have them joining the pilot. Next slide, please. 
So Tiffany already talked about why the FLA doing the living wage pilot in Vietnam, but the background on this pilot is also interesting. So firstly, talking about the legal uh, framework, in 2019, the Vietnam Labor Code has been revised and brought many significant change to the way implementation at enterprise level. Secondly, during COVID-19, the FLA FAIRCOM team was able to design a comprehensive plan of activity, tools, trainings and engagement for a successful pilot. And we finally came up with the pilot run for about two years. We strongly believe that through the pilot activity, the FLA and our company members can have great opportunity to, to keep enhancing buyer and supplier commitment, stakeholder engagement, and last but not least, the worker representation. In next slide uh, of the project overview, you will get more detail why, why I am saying this. Next slide, please. So this slide will provide you the key insight for the pilot. Two factory will work with the ERC and the FLA on understanding areas for improvement to support the living way progress, including procurement, planning, production, compensation system, and HR system. So how is the tool? So the FLA Fair Compensation Toolkit will provide living wage analysis as the demo that you can see uh, earlier by Rusu, showing the gap between the average monthly worker wage and the living wage. As mentioned earlier, worker engagement is the main focal point to drive the progress. Worker perspective and well-being will be considered for training, identifying gaps and solution, benchmarking improvement, and measuring impact after the pilot conclusion. Last but not least, why the factory improve their system. At the same time, FLA will support the buyer to improve purchasing practices and create win-win-win solution for supplier, buyer, and the worker. Next slide, please. And later on, if you have any question on the detail of um, the pilot, please put in the question uh, uh, Q&A section. So here are the methodology we will be using and again to emphasize how the FLA will focus into the worker engagement during the pilot implementation. I would say worker are the main focus for us. For example, during field visit, there will be worker interview, worker and union consultation on com compensation system change, worker training on living wage and change to the compensation. At final stage of the pilot, we also will be exploring worker survey for impact data collection. This activity will be supported by management engagement and very important, the field activity also include document review and interview to verify worker wage data that collected in earlier FOA tool that I mentioned. So this slide is more about updating, uh, um, updating you on where we are so far. We are so happy to report some initial results, including the factory one visit and the stakeholder engagement meeting which happened in Hanoi, October 2022. During factory one visit, we were able to interview the worker and line leader, deep dive interview with many departments in the factory, such as merchandiser, costing, HR, sustainability team and very important, union chairperson and union board member. Not only talking, the researcher also reviewed wage document and conducted focus group discussion. In the same week of the factory one visit, we had a successful stakeholder engagement meeting in Hanoi, Vietnam, where we officially launched the pilot and reported FAIRCOM work that the FLA is doing. So joining online and offline, we welcome representatives from companies, member, non-FLA member, people from Ministry of the Labor, Vietnam General, General Trade Union, and many expert academies who are interested in the way topic in Vietnam. In the slide that you can see, uh, that was the real picture that we took in the stakeholder meeting and so many people that joined online at that time. For your information, we are now working on the reporting for the Factory 1 visit, and we are very excited for the coming Factory 2 visit in March 2023. Um, thank you. So that's all for now, and I'm happy to meet you all again um, to report more about the pilot. And now I hand over back to Tiffany to open the panelists uh, for the company.
Thanks, Vogue, and uh, thank you, Felicia, as well. Uh, as you can tell, our, our Living Wage Pilot is quite the exciting project. Uh, uh, we're working with IGS ERC and supported by the Partnership for Sustainable Textiles, and, and we've also been working with Fairware and making sure that their fair price is available to factories uh, in the pilot, and we've appreciated all the stakeholder engagement interest from organizations like CNV International and IDH um, who attended the the engagement meetings that we had in Hanoi. So now I'm going to shift it over to um, our panel with our company representatives, uh, and I will let uh, Remy and Kristen introduce our uh, introduce yourselves. Uh, and uh, Roshi, we can also take down the slide and just have um, our our heads talking. So Remy, I'll I'll start with you. Could you please introduce yourself and uh, talk a little bit of, of how you got here? Oh, and you're muted. Uh oh, maybe we have a sound problem. Uh oh. Hmm. I wonder. Maybe Kristen will pass it over to you first, and then uh, hopefully we can try to uh, support Remy on her sound issues. So um, go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Kristen Lucis. I am part of the sustainability team at a company called Fanatics. It's a participating company through the Fair Labor Association. We've been a PC through the FLA since 2016 and we were accredited in 2021. Thanks, Kristen. Remy, do, can we hear you now, maybe? Uh, no. I wonder if it's your earbuds? Okay, she's going to try different earbuds. Uh, okay, in the meantime, while we um, uh, hopefully can get Remy sound working, I know we have a few questions in the Q&A, so I will just answer a couple of those uh, to give Remy some time. Uh, we have uh, the question around um, uh, if we're... Um, Collaborating, collaborating with other organizations to avoid duplication of efforts. And uh, yes, that's actually a really important piece of our work. Um, from my knowledge, uh, we have the only wage data collection tool that's publicly available for the fashion manufacturing sector. And so we're really open to having uh, companies use that. It's free and open. Um, and we've been working with other organizations to make sure that it's available. Um, We've uh, uh, been sharing information with uh, Fairware Foundation. Uh, we've um, uh, provided uh, information on the tool with the American Apparel and Footwear Association, along with the Industry Summit. Um, and as Felicia mentioned, we're um, uh, working with a whole slew of, of uh, partnerships uh, through the Living Wage Pilot. Remy, do we have? Thank you. Yes, amazing. Yay. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm glad we have you, Remy. It's been an odyssey to get here. Okay. Right. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Tiffany, for having me. Uh, my name is Remy Arguello, and I work for Adidas' Social and Environmental Affairs Department. I am based in Portland, Oregon, in the U.S., and I joined our team in 2004. Uh, my work has been mostly focused around field operations, so factory monitoring, remediation, stakeholder engagement. But since 2016, I've been supporting our team on the coordination of our fair compensation program. Thanks, Remy and Kristen. Um, and so, Remy, I'd like to maybe start with you um, to talk more about uh, how you got involved with FLA's fair compensation work and, and also supported the development of our tools. Sure, of course. Um, well, I, uh, in to, to, uh, 2015, our company adopted our initial fair compensation strategy. We had done some um, fair wage assessments in the past and had done some issues around or dealt with some issues around wages, but didn't have a formal um, strategy. So. At the time when we adopted the first strategy, we were looking to find a way to assess factories across our supply chain um, in a way that was scalable and practical and accurate. So as an FLA member, we decided to conduct some early pilots 
of the first generation of FLA's fair compensation tool to support the tool's development. Then in 2017, I joined the practitioners working group formally to not only provide FLA with technical advice from a practitioner's perspective, but also as a way to educate myself and our team on the methodology and tools. Um, I'd say the practitioners working group has been a great school for me, and I think it has been a great resource for our team as well. So that's essentially how I started and continued. <laughs> Thank you, Rami. And uh, to be honest, we we could not have done a lot of this work without you and, and the great members of the practitioners working group. Um, Kristen, uh, I I'd love for you to talk more about um, your work at Fanatics um, and especially how you work to scale and improve FLA's wage tool um, to measure um, workers' wages in Fanatics supply chain. Sure. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, so I'll just start with some of the progression or the evolution of, of what we did uh, beginning in 2018 using the wage data collection tool provided by the Fair Labor Association. So we started uh, by casting a pretty wide net, uh, collecting a ton of data um, in 2018 and 2019. And we determined pretty quickly that it, it poses a challenge when you cast that wide a net. Um, and so we learned from that experience knowing that we should really focus on those longer term supplier relationships in order to dive really deeply into the data um, and understand through um, trust building exercises and conversations with suppliers, you know, what may be data that they're um, providing us by mistake or they're miscategorizing. Um, so by, by learning from that, I think we've been able to really refine uh, what we've collected over the years. Um, now we're entering into um, our fifth, um, our fourth or fifth year of collection in some cases. Um, we last year uh, developed a seven point quality control checklist that bolsters what the FLA provides uh, through the wage de demos, the, the videos within the tool itself, um, as well as their guidance. Um, and we found that that seven point checklist really helps um, just as a final kind of check to ensure that whatever we've collected through the tools is, is as refined as we can make it. Um, and that's really uh, what we've done kind of to scale the work with the tool over the years. Thanks, Kristen. I, I appreciate some of the insight that you provided because it's really important um, as a takeaway for, for companies that haven't started wage data collection, and I saw in the, the Q&A, there, there is someone asking if they should start this year, and my answer would be yes. Um, if you haven't started collecting wage data yet, uh, my suggestion would be to start doing it, um, not only because it's the right thing to do to understand you know, how workers' wages are in your supply chain, but we um, definitely anticipate reporting requirements um, through HRDD legislation around living wage or, or workers' wages. Um, um, and so I think, Kristen, your points on making sure that the data is reviewed and you're following a checklist to make sure it's clean to be analyzed is really important because, as I mentioned before, this is not the easiest effort. It is um, it's uh, trying to collect clean data. It's also uh, there's some math involved. And so this is. Um, a program that companies need to invest in uh, and make sure they have the expertise um, with people like Kristen and Remy at their companies leading um, the living wage program implementations at their companies. Um, the other key to success in this work is collaboration. And uh, Kristen and Remy, you've both been um, great champions of this within our FLA membership and a lot of our companies looking to you to um, for advice, but also to figure out how to solve problems. And so can you speak a little bit more about that collaboration? We have a, a task force uh, within the FLA that focuses on the dashboard um, and uh, just speak uh, more, more to that. Sure. Um, I'll start us off and then I'll hand it over to Remy. Um, I'll just talk about the kind of impetus the, or the prerequisites, I should say, um, and then Remy can talk about the rationale that uh, kind of drove the creation of the task force. Um, what we were really hoping for is to gather together um, 
different brands that have already had already worked heavily with the wage data collection tools, as well as with um, the dashboard, um, and they had a keen understanding of of what uh, the challenges may be when they when suppliers uh, are working with those tools and mechanisms. Um, and so we we saw an opportunity there to really gather all of that insight and experience. And I'll turn it over to Remy to talk about um, kind of the the rationale there. Thanks, Kristen. I um, mean, it was in a way a little bit organic how it all started. You know, I think part of the one of the interesting yet challenging things about this work is that it's still fairly new and no one has really figured it out. So I think um, I spent a lot of time talking to Kristen and other colleagues from other brands, just troubleshooting issues, you know, once, you know, around data collection, data analysis, what do you do with the data? Uh, how do we, you know, how do you, how will you report certain things or aspects of the data? And um, we realized that many of us had some of those same questions um, and challenges. And in some ways that was sort of making the, the work more difficult than it really had to be. Uh, at the same time, I think Tiffany, you were also thinking about ways to expand the capacity of the dashboard. I assume because there were other brands coming out to you with questions and, and, and issues. So um, halfway through the year last year, a group of us got together and came up with a list of problems, issues, recommendations that uh, we believe would make the dashboard more, more efficient, more effective, more helpful. Um, one thing we were very adamant about was not just coming to FLA with asks, but also trying to find solutions or work, work around some of these issues. So we, over a session of, you know, I think many months, um, we came up with a number of recommendations and things that, you know, could be done to program them in the, um, in the system as, as much as we could, because we're not tech people, of course. Uh, I think one thing that, what, one thing is that I, that I got from the exercise too, is not only that we share a lot of questions and, and concerns, but I also learn how other brands approach fair compensation, but just the type of, you know, recommendations they were providing. And it was actually also educational for me because as I, as Kristen mentioned, you know, a lot of the time we spend time talking to one another or, you know, sharing same, same concerns, but at the same time, we also share, I think, some best practices. And that to me has been really helpful. So not only in terms of the dashboard was a, I think hopefully a, a helpful exercise, but also in terms of my own approach and improving our own approach um, was also helpful. Thanks, uh, Remy and Kristen. And um, yeah, as, as they both mentioned, uh, we have a practitioners working group that's a multi-stakeholder group. And so they um, help us think through some, uh, some challenging issues um, that we're trying to take forward, um, such as gender pay equity, public reporting, things like that. And um, I effectively asked Remy and Kristen to lead this task force because I still needed a group of companies who are using the dashboard um, to put their heads together to support us on how to make it better. Um, and as Remy mentioned, yeah, we get a lot of feedback because the dashboard is quite the dynamic tool and um, and offers a lot of different ways to analyze your data. And, you know, it just is a snippet of how you can analyze it. And so as companies have been digging deeper into the data, um, they want different ways to analyze it, different ways to slice and dice it so they can present trends and analysis that is informative to their um, senior leadership, uh, their purchasing colleagues colleagues and also um, the suppliers who who are contributing to the data. Um, and I think one of the kind of key successes from that task force was um, the overarching recommendation to think about how to improve the data collection process. Uh, the tool that we have online right now is an Excel tool and it does what it needs to do. But um, as everyone knows, Excel is not always <laughs> your best friend and uh, how you can improve and streamline um, data collection online and automate um, uh, how to find errors and, and uh, well, human errors, but also calculate errors, things like that. Um, 
to improve the quality so that we can have better analysis and more efficient analysis um, is really important for, for the companies at FLA um, as we continue to try to um, tackle improvement as well. Uh, and so maybe I'll end with the, this last question because we have um, quite a lot of questions in the Q&A, so we'll start to dig through them. Um, but can I ask you both to comment where you see there are opportunities for our work um, on collaboration on living wage um, uh, beyond FLA's membership? I can get started if you like. Um, I think the, you know, the opportunities are endless. Um, I, you know, even when I look at data collection, I would still like to challenge us um, in ways to collaborate around data collection. There are for sure issues around um, antitrust, you know, that need to be looked into, but I find the exercise somewhat repetitive for some factories. You know, you have factories providing data collection, sometimes in different formats, not just through the FLA tool, but other tools. So what can we do as an industry to, you know, to collect the data without having to ask suppliers to run that exercise multiple times. Um, when it comes to implementation, I think that this is an area we really haven't explored so much. So whether, you know, we would like to come together when it comes to addressing specific issues, um, for example, or, or some of the levers, for example, that some of us have adopted to support wage progression. So whether, for example, we want to collaborate on things around industrial relations and supporting uh, the strengthening and development of industrial relations through capacity building or other things. Uh, you touched on gender. I think that's an area that we still need to further explore uh, and also work on. Um, there is some work around it, but I don't think that there it has been specifically done very uh, detailed. So, you know, gender is definitely, I think, one that Personally, we, we, we would be interested in, in collaborating with, with others on it. Um, and then government engagement as well. I think that you know, many of us source from the same countries, have the same concerns. Um, and then finally, I think um, through the FLA community. I mean, I think that that has been a starting point. And I know you said beyond FLA, but those, you know, that companies or, or stakeholders that haven't been engaged so much through FLA, uh, find ways for us to collaborate more. And maybe those of us that are FLA members can use the FLA as sort of that, um, that mechanism to, to work with, with other brands or other MSIs or stakeholders. Thanks, Remy. Kristen, anything to add? Sure, um, I'll just add a couple other points. Um, one being, of course, um, folks who are on this um, webinar right now may already know that there were a number of other side sessions uh, this week offered through the forum, um, different hosts uh, to earlier today through the industry we want and um, shift. Uh, and I would argue that, I mean, they're definitely looking at living wage work um, in different ways. I mean, there's different facets that that need to be addressed in tandem with what the FLA is doing and what, what FLA participating companies are doing. But it's um, work that also needs to be understood just as much as what we're doing here, which is, is more uh, re related to the practitioner space. Um, but um, I got a lot out of those, those side sessions, just understanding, um, for instance, what uh, shift and capitals coalition living wage really, living wages accounting model hopes to achieve um, I think it'll be really interesting to see uh, we have been a better buying participant for um, several years and and the data that you get out of those surveys is really uh, second to none I mean you can't um, get that data from just regular engagement with suppliers um, and so that that data is really important to understand. Not only are you where you're falling short in terms of responsible planning and purchasing practices internally, but also um, over time, how those kind of shortcomings translate into um, impacts to living wages and being able to try to tell that story and talk to talk the talk, so to speak, with your internal stakeholders, the folks that are. Uh, engaging with suppliers regularly um, and have more of those business conversations and, and discuss uh, costing, you need to be able to, 
to use the vocabulary that they use in order to start to have conversations about living wage. So we've gotten a lot out of, out of that uh, partnership. Thanks, Kristen. And, and thanks for mentioning some of the other side sessions on living wage. There have been a lot of them um, this time around of the OECD side session which has been really exciting. Um, we've also been really impressed with shifts, um, shift and uh, capital, capitals coalitions work on the um, accounting for living wage model um, and wanting to make sure the, the data that our companies are collecting can fit into that model um, as we recognize that shift is proposing um, really comprehensive reporting metrics that investors and uh, legislation may consider. So that is definitely um, a partnership that we've been I'm working with um, closely with Jenny Holdcraft on. Uh, and Felicia, I'd like to invite you also to comment on, on this question, to talk a little bit about the opportunities that you, you've seen. You've mentioned some, but um, uh, would love for you to talk a little bit more on it. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's a it's a great question because in, in this industry particularly, we see that there's a multitude of um, initiatives um, working on different but also overlapping topics. And while we applaud that there is so much of it. Um, sometimes that makes the need for harmonization a little um, more urgent. So this is why also within IGS, we, we do work towards harmonization or at least making possibilities for, um, for collaboration. Uh, and, and what I have mentioned regarding the pilot project uh, is particularly that, that not only FLA members, but also members from um, the Partnership for Sustainable Textiles, a German initiative, as well as Fairware can participate uh, in this project and we do uh, interchange on, on the tools that are being used. Um, maybe to highlight another um, topic that we do tackle within IGS is the common framework for responsible purchasing practices, another um, multi, uh, another collaboration between several MSIs including Fairware, ETI, and the German uh, Partnership for Sustainable Textiles on giving a framework on what it means to have responsible purchasing practices that is also um, aligned more between those MSIs. So this is also a, a particular instance of, of collaboration that I wanted to mention here. Thanks, Felicia. Uh, yeah, so a lot of opportunities for collaboration and and a lot that um, Roshu and I and Fung um, tried to facilitate at FLA. If um, you feel that we should be collaborating with you and you're on this call, please um, send us a note and we're happy to get in touch. Um, Fung, I'd like to um, uh, shoot a question over to you around the pilot. Uh, someone has asked what is the biggest challenge for you on working on this pilot? So want to share some thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, uh, the ultimate goal for uh, this pilot is using uh, the collaborative effort in the multi-share factory um, to improve uh, or to make the living way progress. But um, for example, uh, one brand when they nominate one factory, so we need to reach out to another buyer who are participating in uh, in the sourcing from the factory. However, each uh, different brand that they have different model of the business, production planning, and uh, costing something like that. So how we how we can be um, ally uh, on how we can be ally uh, on reaching the same voice in making the progress in the living way in the factory would be the more challenging. Even though a lot of commitment that we can have from our member buyer at the beginning, but in the reality, it's not easy at all when we cut into the reality. Yeah, I believe that Tiffany, that you can tune in. Thanks, Fung. Yeah, I think those are very much uh, some of the challenges that, that we faced. Uh, I'm just going to comment on another question that came through um, asking if we plan to pilot the same um, kind of pilot in the U.S. And uh, and I think there are a few other questions around the U.S. as well. So I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, we are... Uh, the, the goal of the pilot is to figure out, um, you know, how to improve wages and then figure out, can we apply and scale similar, similar learnings in similar setting countries? And with Vietnam, we have uh, unique circumstances where we've seen year over year improvement uh, from the government on the labor code and also the minimum wage. Uh, we also recognize there's a wage level system um, that's um, 
part of the labor code in, in Vietnam as well. Um, and so those kind of legislative mechanisms really allow us to uh, pilot a few opportunities to improve workers' wages. Um, and so what I'm really trying to get at is there is support from the government uh, on living wage in Vietnam in a way that we don't always see in other countries. And I would say for the US, we aren't seeing that. Um, you know, maybe state by state, there are some countries, uh, sorry, some states that uh, have um, committed to higher minimum wages, um, uh, especially in California, and I believe in New York and a few other states uh, over time, but we haven't seen that from um, a countrywide um legislation. And so we do need to see more governance support on um, living wage in the U.S., along with uh, overtime hours. In, in the U.S., there's no maximum of overtime hours in the U.S. And so this pilot itself may be difficult to apply in the U.S. and um, show that living wage progress is possible. I'll also mention another country. I don't think this pilot is workable in Bangladesh um, for similar reasons that we're not seeing the same type of commitment um, by the government to improve workers' wages. And so for different countries where we're seeing living wage gaps, we have to tackle um, different methods of improving it. And it could be looking at um, collective bargaining at a sector-wide level. Uh, that's great work that ACT has been leading. Um, and also CNV International piloting um, kind of smaller um, uh, collective bargaining agreements within countries as well. And so, um, you know, how we apply those learnings um, to closing the living wage gap is something that we're also um, planning to do in, in the next few years. Um, uh, so that's what I'll just mention as far as uh, piloting and scaling learnings into different countries. But it is the goal for us to take learnings from the Vietnam pilot and apply them and share them um, with uh, with stakeholders as well. Um, OK, we have a few uh, other we got, we got quite a bit of other um uh, questions. Uh, Roshu, I saw a question asking for the wage tool. If you could um, maybe put that in the chat again so people have that. Um, maybe I'll also take the question around accounting for uh, gender differences. Um, and as Remy mentioned, this is something that we're looking to expand our work on. Uh, currently, our wage tool um, asks for the number of men and women within each occupation. And then our dashboard allows you to see um, uh, the average net wage for those occupations and um, those that are predominantly um, occupied by women versus men. And so you can see somewhat of a, a gender pay gap, but we are looking to improve that. Um, and that is uh, part of the work that the task force has emphasized for us is ensuring that we can get um, better data on gender uh, pay equity, because we also recognize this will be um, an important uh, reporting metric as well. Um, and I, uh, I'm going to address the question around antitrust implications and collaboration, and, and I'll ask Remy and Kristen to chime in on this as well. Um, uh, you know, antitrust, uh, when it comes to living wages and purchasing practices, incredibly sensitive in the U.S. And so how we structure the work really has to be a bit protective um, so that we're not uh, running the risk of violating these regulations. Uh, for us, it means ensuring that everyone understands that um, no one can say that this is the price. Otherwise, we're all walking because that is very much an antitrust uh, violation. Um, and so every company has to make Make its own actions um, uh, and have its own decision making processes in place uh, and and still uphold living wage as a commitment and, and a human right. Um, it does it can make things a little challenging, but at the same time at the FLA, we are used to working with all of our different companies, uh, reviewing their purchasing practices, giving them advice and insight and ensuring that um, there isn't any. Um, um, you know, kind of risk of even appearing like um, uh, we are um, violating antitrust risks. So uh, Remy and Kristen, do you want to speak a little bit to that and maybe how you navigated that in your collaboration with the companies? Sure. I mean, we, we to be honest, when it comes to things like data collection, we, we have not collaborated with other brands because of the antitrust concerns. Uh, Although I, I wonder if there is a way to be able to share some data, um, you know, without violating um, those same antitrust concerns. Uh, when it comes to 
for example, sharing best practices, we mostly focus around the process and now what we do with the data, how we report the data. Um, and in terms of implementation, you know, this is, we have more or less public information on that, what our plans around implementation will be. Um, I know, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, last year, we collaborated with a number of brands on uh, responsible purchasing practices, uh, training, uh, e-learning development through better buying. And I think that worked really well in the sense that we engaged with better buying, commissioned better buying to create the training materials, and then each brand kind of went their own way to disseminate the, the information. Uh, I think it's going to be one of those things that we'll have to figure out as we go. Um, but one that I think we need to consider if we want to collectively have action, which I think is necessary to move this forward. Um, I'll just add from more of a perspective of a company that's um, kind of in the at the beginning stages of doing this work and collecting data and trying to analyze it. Um, I don't feel that antitrust um, regulation should prevent you from being able to reach out to companies that have already been doing this work for many years and they've learned a lot of lessons from what to do, what not to do in terms of collecting data in particular, but also just uh, analyzing and visualizing the data. There's a lot to, um, to learn from that once you have this big, um, big bucket of, of data, how to properly sift through it and tell a story that makes sense to your internal business partners. Um, and we've learned a lot from having individual conversations just on that with uh, both FLA participating companies and, and non-participating companies. Also doing um, some some research and, and uh, open source benchmarking of ESG reports can be a really simple way to start to understand what are companies actually publishing um, and sharing with the public about uh, their work related to living wages um, and and what is a story that they're already telling that that makes sense and maybe uh, what are some some areas that can that brands can improve within um, and then. We've also learned a lot uh, from those conversations and just how to make business cases um, with our internal team members to talk about how do we approach the, uh, the subject of living wage. Um, and you can, you can do a lot with those conversations without talking about individual suppliers, the data that you're collecting and those numbers. Uh, so it, there's still lots of work that can be done. Thanks, Remy and Kristen. We have a minute left and we might go over time a little bit because I do want to address all the questions we have around data validation, audits, and things like that. So I think someone had asked around um, usability of audit data and can you use audit data instead of collecting the wage data. The challenge that we found with audit data is it's largely focused on compliance and regulations. And when we're talking about living wage there, we're going beyond the regulations, we're going beyond the minimum requirements. And so I think um, our companies found that they can't really use their audit data to measure living wage progress because it's really just showing them, you know, if there are minimum wage violations or other compensation issues. Um, so we developed the wage data collection tool to kind of be used um, as another data collection tool, but that also can be verified through the audit process. And so the one thing that we communicate to our companies is that if you are um, having transparency issues with your factory is around double bookkeeping, other records, and you um, can't verify which are the true records, that is not a factory to start wage data collection with. That's a factory that you need to um, focus on transparency and trust, ensuring that you understand what's actually happening at the factory before you actually start that data collection process. Um, and it's a key part of starting um, wage data collection is to engage with your factories and suppliers, make sure that they understand why this is important and why it's important that they're transparent about it. Um, 
from there, you can collect your data and, and companies have different uh, kind of timing and uh, ways to execute that. Um, but at the end of the day, it does need to be validated and verified. So Kristen mentioned that they have a seven step checklist that helps them validate the data, make sure there weren't any errors in entry. But that audit that happens you know, every year or so um, can also help verify through the payroll records that the data the factory has provided is valid and accurate. Um, our data is set, our data collection tool is set up to pull aggregate totals, so we're not um, running the risk of any GDPR or personal data violations. Um, but at the end of the day, those averages should be reflective um, in the payroll review that um, happens at the audit, but also in the worker interviews. Um, Auditors should be asking questions to workers about the different payment types. Are they earning them? Do they recognize them? Um, and are there different benefits that they also recognize um, and are part of their um, uh, compensation pay slips as well? Uh, anything, uh, Remy and Kristen and Fung, you want to add to that? I can add a little bit. To I would just stress that. Yeah, go ahead, Remy. I think there's a time zone delay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, just quickly, you know, would stress the transparency issue and the fact that data collection is not a compliance exercise. This is not a way to verify if factories are complying with the law. Uh, that is what monitoring and other activities uh, should be, uh, because at the end of the day, all this is is giving you an idea or uh, I guess a, a data point in terms of how much workers make in that factory for you to later track and, and measure over time. So I think you know it's important to understand that this is not an exercise and it'll only work if there is transparency and trust between you and your supplier. And I would just echo what you said, Tiffany, and what you said, Remy, as well. It You really do need to build that trust. Um, and sometimes it starts from a very um, basic level, and that's okay. So you do need to start somewhere. Um, I think that you, when you do start to analyze data over time, you start to identify some suppliers that really struggle with knowing how to bucketize the data, knowing how to harvest it, knowing whether they are using the, the correct uh, data. So there is room there to partner with third parties to, to verify the data, but I would just caution that practice because of the fact that you want to build that trust first. You want to have these conversations with suppliers explaining why you're collecting the data, why it's important for them to, to use real figures. Um, and third parties should only be used if, if the, the supplier itself has um, some familiarity with the third party and, and know, you know who they represent and, and, and trust that they're not uh, conducting a gotcha exercise, that they're really just trying to help them input the right figures and the right data. Um, so there's room there for that, but uh, by and large, I think uh, doing this just brand to supplier is the right way to go and then spot checking where suppliers are struggling and doing some some on-site work where possible. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Remy. So we're going to wrap up our, our webinar. Thanks, everyone who stayed a few minutes um, to listen to those questions. And uh, I do want to address there are quite a few questions around um, uh, small, small companies and how we work with them. And, and I'll just say our approach is actually pretty similar to how we work with large companies, too. We have to start with that first person at that company um, to uh, train them up on living wage and the basics and make sure that they're an advocate within their company on uh, scaling this work internally. And then we work with them to um, address how this is impacting resources. And so making sure that they can develop a plan on wage data collection and strategy that are within their within their bandwidth and um, address their supply chain needs. Uh, and you know, from there, we're just continuing to build up capacity within companies and then um, offering avenues of support and collaboration with others because it is a lot easier to work with other companies to gain understandings of how they've tackled um, these issues as well. Uh, so thanks everyone for, for joining. And I wanna um, give a big thanks to our, our panelists, Remy and Kristen, Felicia and Fung and Roshu who, who drove our, our webinar today. 
And we have some QR codes uh, on the screen for some of our other materials on living wage. I hope this webinar has given you um, at least some ideas on how to move forward and take action on this, on this particular human rights challenge. And thanks again for joining our OECD side session. Especially for those in Asia who uh, uh, who spend your Valentine night uh, with us uh, for the call <laughs> instead you. of uh, enjoying time with your beloved one. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Fung, and thanks everyone. Have a good uh, rest of your day, evening, or afternoon. Thank you. Thank Bye. You Bye. Thanks.